It's my favourite part of the day. Yes, it really is, because the GB News Tavern is declared open. It's time for Talking Pints, and I'm joined by Tom Bauer. Tom, welcome Thank you very to much. the programme. Very good to see yeah. you. Mm. Now, I, the, whole, the whole area of biography because I've just had it done to me by yeah. Michael Crick, who's written a book about me. Now, I, haven't, I have to confess, I haven't read it, um, but lots of people have told me things about it. And from what they say, you know, he's actually not been too unpleasant about me and I've got nothing to worry about, and that's what everyone tells me. I'm guessing your subjects, when they find out you're on their case, are they pretty scared? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't fail. <laughs> well, you say that, but that, this is what interests me. I said this before the break about, you know, what your motivations are. I mean, you've had a very, very long career in journalism, you know, at the BBC for a quarter of a century uh, producing. And, hey, the BBC did do fantastic documentaries, didn't it? They did. It was you, a great time. You know, real investigative journalism, yep. breaking amazing stories, uh, making and breaking governments to a certain extent as well. So you've had this long career in journalism. And you've now used that skill to write, write books, write, write biographies. Uh, but I wonder, when you pick a subject, and you've, you know, we've had Prince Charles and we've had Richard Branson and we've had a whole host of people, Maxwell, who I'm quite keen to talk to you about, a whole host of people, do you go into writing a biography assuming the worst about the individual, assuming the best about the individual, being open mind? How do you pick and choose those that you write about? Well, I only pick and choose people who are influential. They've got to have power or want to exercise influence over society. Yep. I don't pick people who uh, don't enjoy the exercise of telling people what to do and how governments should work or run governments. And invariably, those people are, by definition, narcissists and people who have tried to cover up their past. And my technique, my enjoyment is to find the victims of their climb up the greasy pole who tell me the truth about what happened in the past which they've tried to cover up and that invariably leads to some amazing revelations and the truth about people, I mean whether it's Tony Blair or Gordon Brown or uh, Boris Johnson recently, <laughs> let alone Tiny Rowland and Mohammed Fayed, all of them, they all got skeletons in the cupboard They've all done things which they would prefer us not to know about. But at the same time, they're trying to tell us how to run their life, how to run our lives. So that's the incentive. And so is it, for those that reach the top, you know, whether it's Robert Maxwell, newspaper tycoon, uh, you know, Blair, successful prime minister, winning three general elections... I mean, is it necessary to be a narcissist, then, to, to, to those that strive to reach the top? Are they all narcissists? Yes, there's nothing wrong with being a narcissist. I mean, you can't get to the top and stay at the top if you're sensitive to criticism, if you don't have a total and utter belief in yourself, because if you don't believe in yourself, then you won't get people to follow you. So there's nothing, in my view, wrong with that. Uh, when you say Tony Blair was a successful Prime Minister, yes, that, in your terms, he was, because he won elections. He won three. But in my terms, he was a terrible failure. Uh, and the book, which I think of the 26 I've written is the most, most important, exposes how Blair was actually a rather poor prime minister. I mean, he lied about so many things, mm. destroyed so many things, not least the Iraq war, yeah. but also on immigration, on the health service and on education. Uh, it was bad on the army. I mean, there's a lot of things on energy. The reason we have an energy problem now... They started is it. He yeah, started yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. All those things. Yeah. Uh, and that all started under Blair, and I found that fascinating because he had got the media on his side. Everyone was saying how marvellous he was, and I discovered the truth by literally interviewing the civil servants at the bottom of the pile and working my way up to the permanent secretaries in the departments or the generals and field marshals and discovering the truth. Now, on the other hand, of course, I never get their cooperation except in two cases, and that was very interesting uh, because the two people who I did talk to and got on well with uh, were Simon Cowell and Bernie Eccleston. Okay. And what happened there was, in the case of uh, Simon Cowell, I always wanted to write about music, and someone said to me that they'd, I should do Cowell. I said, well, I don't know about that. He's... Not that important. And, he, of course, he was critical. So I began digging into his past. 
and suddenly got a phone call from a very famous person who said, Simon Cowell would like to meet you. And I said, well, I never meet the people I write about uh, till perhaps towards the end. Anyway, I met him, and we had the most amazing eight months together, flying in his private jet between London and L.A. <laughs> and, of course, once he was, once he was at 37,000 feet in his, ex, in his private jet, he was with me for 10 hours. He had to talk. And I got some amazing story. And the same then happened with Bernie Eccleston. Um, and they were very interesting people because they're both men so who love power. Be, would they be authorised biographers no, in that case they or not? No, because they hated them. <laughs> Did they? <laughs> oh, God. Uh, the, the, the cowl one, I had the front page of The Sun for five days in succession. As the editor said to me, even Diana only had four days yeah, when she died. Yeah. And Bernie Eccleston said to me, I could sue you for libel. I said, of course you could. No, no, they had a lot of stuff they hated. Have you ever been sued for libel? Endlessly. Endlessly? Yeah. And, and have you lost many cases? Not one. It all started, well, it started with the BBC, but the most, of course, the most vociferous litigant was Robert Maxwell, 11 writs. Yeah. Now, and he didn't stop. He started this whole idea of destroying the author by bombarding him and the publisher and the booksellers and everyone with writs to suppress, because... And I was rather proud of it, because it, that was one of my great achievements. It, it was in 1988 I wrote his biography called The Outsider yeah. and predicted that because he was a crook, he'd go down three years later, and it was to the day, 1991, although I didn't push him over the boat. Uh, but, you know, it, he was... And his crooked life was fascinating. Yes, it was all an invention, wasn't it, right from 1944? No, he was a very or... talented, courageous man. I mean, he was an astonishing businessman, mm. but he always was a crook. Yeah. He was far, his father was a horse smuggler in Ruthenia, so he never knew any, what the honest business was. And then he had his chance when he was in Berlin at the end of the Second World War and ran amazing black market deals there and then brought that talent to Britain. And now his daughter, of course, who's yeah. re reached the same level of infamy, or well, not quite. But... And his sons. I mean, Kevin and Ian were instrumental in parceling off all the pension fund shares. Yeah. They were, I sat through their trial for a year. It was an astonishing trial. Yeah, I mean, that, the whole thing was a terror. Now, in that case, there clearly are genuine victims, people that were yeah. really hurt by yeah. their actions. I guess you can never reach the top completely in life without a few people falling by the wayside, can you? Well, there are honest businessmen. I wouldn't say that. I mean, I think Richard Branson, who I've written two books about, is one of the most successful businessmen and one of the most dishonest businessmen. And the victims are legion. There are just so many victims. But what's interesting, you see, about a victim of a businessman is this. Invariably, they're businessmen themselves. And no businessman wants to admit they've been raped. They don't want to admit they've been defeated. Yeah. And Richard Branson raped many, many decent, honest people who came to him with great ideas. And he was very, very ruthless with them, to put it legally polite. And uh, those people then told their stories, whether it was in the music business, whether it was Virgin Cruises, whether it was the space business, where his, his dishonesty on the space race thing is, is legion. I mean, Musk has really exposed Branson there. But also the trains, everything. He was a very, very ruthless and untrustworthy man, but got away with it. Very vicious and suing. He sued me twice and lost. People sue you, and you say, you know, they never get anywhere because you're confident of what you write, and you check what you write. Do you ever feel... Any other threats from rich and famous? Oh, Mohammed Fayed. There was a wonderful story. I did Fayed. Uh, uh, I did Tiny Roland, who ran I an remember. amazing operation yeah. in Africa. And Fayed loved that book. It gave me lots of help because he hated... Well, they were competitors and rivals because of the battle for Harrods and everything. And uh, because I was getting on very well with Fayed, I saw him a lot when he had Diana in the south of France in August 1970, 1997. Yeah. I was, went to see him every week, twice in Harrods, because the story was phenomenal. And if you remember at the time, it was just in the aftermath of the Cash for Questions, Neil Hamilton. He had a lot of information, because he was always blackmailing, bugging, and doing scurrilous things. Anyway, when Diana died that Saturday night, I arranged to go with him, uh, his people, the following day to the Ritz, in Paris, where she had set off from yeah. on her fatal last journey. Yeah. And when I was there, I discovered that Fayed was something beyond belief. So I decided to write the biography of Mohammed Fayed because no one really knew who he was and what he was up to. Anyway, to cut the story short, one so of the most important people was the Sheikh of uh, Dubai, the Maktoum family, where he'd made his fortune. 
and the Maktoums hated him because he'd taken, skimmed off 25% for himself, put it in his pocket. One day I got a call from the security chief of the Maktoums and said, I've got bad news, good news and bad news for you. I said, well, what's the bad news? The bad news, he said, is that Mohammed Fayed has put out a contract to break your fingers so you can't write your book. Charming. I said, what's the good news? He said, they couldn't find anyone in London to do it. I said, what's the next bad news then? He's now looking in Liverpool. <laughs> I like it. It's a very good story. And would he have meant it, do you think? Oh, God, yes. Yeah. He was ruthless. I mean, you know, I never went into Harrah's uh, because, of course, he had me arrested for shoplifting. His head of security tried endlessly to entrap me in all sorts of things. He's dead now. Former head of the Scotland Yard uh, fraud squad. I mean, fired was an unbelievable piece of cake. What about those people who don't necessarily choose... Um, their lives. They're not businessmen, they're not politicians, but they're born into position. Prince Charles, born hmm. into his position. He's not had much choice, really, has he? He's right. had to go into it. Um, but Prince Harry, of course, has been, some would argue, taken away from his position by Meghan Markle. Right. And I, under I understand Meghan is your next book, is yeah, that right? Yeah, just finished it. Yeah. yeah, just finished it. Yeah. I think the thing about Charles is, I wrote a book which I really did enjoy writing, is you're right, uh, he was born into it, yeah. but he did some extraordinarily stupid things. He did some great things, but behaved in some ways bizarrely. Is he a decent human being? Uh, he's a very selfish man, but he is decent. He wants to do well. Yeah. I think he'll be a, a, a questionable king. I think the background is just too, too difficult now. But, uh, you know, he's helped a lot of young people through the Prince's Trust. He was very much in advance of the public mood on the environment. But on the other hand, with his strange views on medicine or architecture in terms of some people and other things, and his extraordinary lifestyle, very, very self-indulgent, um, I'd say pretty questionable. Um, <laughs> well, I hope you're wrong, because the monarchy... Be actually, the I mean, the monarchy served us very well as a country. I agree, it? I agree. And that's why I'm doing Meghan Markle. Yes. So the book's finished. book's finished. Being released sometime in the near future. Right. Well, I'm not going to ask you questions about it. because You, you can. No, you well, can. Well, I mean, I mean, how awful is she? Well, I think the thing about Meghan Markle is that she's fascinating. And I think what you've got to take into account is that however awful she has been vis-à-vis uh, -vis the British royal family, mm. in her terms, she has been an amazing success. After all, you take a woman who's an insignificant actress... I'd, ne failure, I'd never heard of No six. one had heard of her, <laughs> who'd had... Are endlessly unsuccessful relationships, and she is now a global star. Now, who's is that not a success? Yes, it is a success, and she'll dump Harry, will she, at some point? I don't think so. No? No, he's terribly happy in California. You know, he's much nicer watching surfers in Santa Monica than uh, shaking hands in Scunthorpe. Well, you say that, but wasn't the army a really important part of who yes, Harry he was? Yes, he couldn't stay there. He, he, was, you know, he wasn't clever enough to be promoted. Now, talking of dark secrets, and you try and examine all of these secrets... Not, so you were me, a 1968 <laughs> revolutionary, I Yes, understand. I was, yes. Yeah, Along yeah. with people like Danny Cohn Bendit, yeah, who I knew in the European Alley and all Parliament. That, yeah, I yeah. mean, that was an extraordinary period. Yes. A lot of those people, of course, did go on to achieve really quite prominent positions. How long... I know, so if you're a Marxist in 1968... Yeah. And you joined the BBC in 1970. Yeah. I guess you were about right for the BBC, really. Absolutely. Fitting <laughs> 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 like a glove. <laughs> and how left-wing are you today? Oh, very, very unleft-wing. I've got a social conscience. And I think, actually, my books are all in the end, all this digging into these people of power and the rest, is all based on that period where I was very sceptical and cynical and quizzical about the power brokers. So I think... I have no apologies about that. No. It was a great period, and rightly, uh, you, ha you know, young people should start with the heart looking after the oppressed, and when you get older, you <laughs> have other considerations. <laughs> but it was an extraordinary period to grow up in. I was at the LSE, not far from here. It was yep. the finest place for education in those days. And uh, not a minute regret. It was excellent. I, I did law there. I became a barrister, 
and I had the most amazing teachers. I was sort of half joking about the Marxists at the BBC, no, but we do look at the BBC. Many oh, of us look at the yeah. BBC as being not just centre left, but very metropolitan, very yeah. very London centric in its thinking. Yeah. I mean, our things, and I know you spent a long time there, yeah. and you're proud of the work you did at the BBC, mm. but do you really think, in broadcasting terms, that the licence fee is sustainable going on? I do, because I don't think there's any alternative. But I think what you've got to realise is, and people don't, is that when I was at BBC, it was amazingly inventive, and we actually did have to consider balance, so that if there wasn't balance, there was a huge row, which is people don't understand that anymore now. They just think it's... Propaganda will put it out and don't. I mean, Newsnight yeah. is just sheer left wing. Uh, you saw with Emily Maitlis that that would never have happened in my day there. It was impossible even for five minutes. Okay. Uh, so you had to always balance and produce facts and all the rest of it. But the most important thing about the BBC in those days was that it took risk, it was entertaining, it was original, it was unbelievably. Uh, exciting. Well, even the comedy. I mean, they pushed the edges, didn't exactly. they, of, of what was exactly. accepted I mean, or not. You know, that, the week, that, that was the week there was and all that thing. Yeah. You couldn't do that now. There was one man was responsible for destroying the whole BBC, risk-taking, free access, and that was John Burt. Mm. And he was a control freak, an untalented man who actually suppressed original thinking. And the BBC, sadly, has never recovered from that. So we go on with the licence fee, but we have to get a better rejuvenated BBC. We just need to get different people. I mean, right. I think the, yeah. the structure is every country in Europe has a state uh, licence fee broadcaster. And they, you look at the decline of Netflix. It's terrible now. Uh, look at ITV. It's not doing well. The BBC has got three billion a year they should make some great programmes. They, yeah, they really should be very original. They should be. <laughs> no, I agree but with they you. they choose the wrong people. Oh, I agree with and you. And it's the people, not the structure. No. Well, it's, you've had a fascinating career, Tom. You really have. I'm very pleased you haven't written a book about me, I have to tell you. <laughs> well, there was, a, there was a moment, I did, Nigel. Yeah, I did there wonder. Was, if we'd had the fourth bottle of wine, <laughs> we might have got to it. <laughs> we, had dinner, we had dinner a few years ago, and I'm thinking, this guy's meeting me with an ulterior motive. <laughs> Tom, thank you for joining me. On Pleasure. Thanks Pines. very much. Thank you very much indeed. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.